Welcome to today's University of Texas Energy Symposium, hosted by the Energy Institute. I'm Carrie King, research scientist and assistant director. Before I introduce today's speaker, I will highlight next week's talk, which will be uh, Ryan Sitton, Sitton, who is a former railroad commissioner of Texas, and he's the founder and CEO of Pinnacle, and he'll be talking about his book, Crucial Decisions. But today, it is my pleasure to host a colleague here from University of Texas at the Bureau of Economic Geology, um, senior research scientist Michael Young is going to talk to us about the land energy nexus in Texas. Uh, so Dr. Young is an expert in understanding soil and water science. He has a PhD uh, in that area. And he is formerly from the Desert Research Institute in Nevada before coming to the BEG here at UT some, not sure, almost 10 years ago. 10 years um, ago. Yeah. Um, and he also serves like I do on the Committee for the Energy and Earth Resources Program, uh, helping uh, with that multidisciplinary program. So today he's gonna tell us about the development of both fossil and renewable energy uh, and the land impacts, particularly in the area of West Texas and the Permian Basin. So we're going to learn the nuances of this uh, and impacts on the environment. So. With that said, I am now going to stop sharing and hand it over to Michael to start the presentation. And to remind everyone, I will say, if you have questions, please submit them at any time via the Q&A feature of the Zoom webinar. And just a clarifying question, I might try to ask Michael during his presentation, but otherwise I will summarize those questions at the end of his talk. Uh, so with that said, I will now stop talking and Michael, floor Great. is yours. Thank you, Carrie. I just want to make sure that you're seeing the right screen here and not uh, uh, not any of the other screens. If you see the, I'm just flipping back and forth. Hopefully everything's good. Um, and uh, and so assuming that we're good, uh, thank you, Carrie, for inviting me to the Energy Institute to give this talk. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, in my group here at the Bureau for the last several years. And, and you know, all research requires a team of people. There's uh, very few single, uh, single PI researchers out these days. And so I just want to acknowledge John Paul Pierre, Catherine Jones, and John Andrews, who have uh, been working tirelessly uh, and receiving emails very late at night uh, to get the data that we need to, to make this uh, a good show. Um, and so, you know, one of the things uh, that we are trying to do here at the Bureau and uh, as we kind of think through some of these, um, these issues is we try to really look at what's the reality of the situation. And we know that if we want to have a stable society, then we need to have equitable, affordable and sustainable sources of energy, land and water. And you need to have those. Um, but at the same time, every one of the choices that we make when we try to balance these, these elements of our society, they come at some cost. There's no uh, free source of electricity out there uh, from the standpoint of what the impact might be. And so if we understand what the future demand for energy is going to be, and we understand what the costs are, then that helps us to make better decisions in the future. And it helps us to innovate um, to, to improve uh, the things that we're doing. And that's really the, the goal here. So, um, you know, for this talk, you know, what are the goals we're going to try to to, to, I'm going to try to articulate here. Um, determine the likelihood that a particular type of energy source is going to be developed at a particular location over the next several decades. And um, our field site is going to be in, in West Texas in the Permian Basin. Um, this group here, I don't need to describe the Permian Basin to you. It's a huge energy area, both uh, oil and gas, and it's of great interest right now to wind and solar. And so how do we uh, blend um, the installation of this infrastructure in a very large uh, geographic area um, and maintaining a lot of the attributes of West Texas that we hold, um, we hold dear to us. And so um, let me just kind of start off with a little bit of uh, the background and I'll kind of tee this up. Um, I'm sure you all have seen this. This is the uh, Energy Information Agency uh, Energy Outlook um, and uh, this is sort of a 2020, I kind of moved that line from 2019 over to 2020, but this is about uh, sort of pre-COVID expectations of what we might be able to expect in the future. And the graph on the right really shows a large increase in solar and wind at the national scale. 
Um, and at the same time, we would see, uh, you know, um, coal decrease, um, nuclear is about, uh, about the same, and then, but the renewables are, are going up uh, quite a bit as well as, as well as to make up the difference. So, you know, with all of these um, choices that we're making, and, you know, we're really looking at the next 20 to 30 years, um, you know, these are going to have some uh, potential impacts to landscapes. And, um, and this becomes particularly important considering that the energy density of oil and gas is so much higher than wind and solar that in order to generate the same amount of electricity, um, you, need to, to, you need more land in order to support the infrastructure that's going to be needed um, to generate the power that we are looking for. And so this paper from Trainer and others um, just was kind of looking at what might be expected in terms of square kilometers needed in the future. Um, to support energy. And you can see the, uh, if you can see the scale on the bottom right here, I, I'll use my mouse here, and that's 800,000 square kilometers of land. And so this is at the, you know, this is at the, the um, this is a lot of land. It's a very, very broad um, study that they conducted. And you can see the, uh, all the different energy sources up on the top. Now, um, this was completed and uh, published in 2016, five years ago. And we can probably assume that the, um, you know, that these are changing. These are changing because of uh, government policies and they're changing because the price of, of uh, wind and solar are going down, um, at least uh, without, uh, you know, without incentives. And so, you know, this is a constant um, um, challenge to stay up to date and, and to uh, provide uh, information that's timely uh, going forward. And, um, you know, the other aspect that I mentioned before is, is, is density. And so when you really look at the sort of the punch behind uh, fossil energy and natural gas, nuclear oil, and coal here is what I'm referring to. And these are these, these blocks up here. So this graph just shows the power density in watt per meter square. So this is how much energy is potential divided by the area that it's taking. Uh, in order to support it. And you can see that, uh, that, that natural gas, oil, and, uh, and coal have a much, much higher energy density. So in order to generate the same amount of electricity, it would require less land um, in, order to, in order to support. So that's, that's kind of what the message is. I and mean, you look at solar and wind, and these, these numbers are down in the, these are in the lower numbers. Um, and uh, there's huge numbers of assumptions behind these, which, um, which I will sort of demonstrate um, going forward. And so, you know, we, we, I'd like to have, you know, really nice pictures. Uh, and this is a picture of West Texas in the Big Bend area. And this is the setting for a lot of the work that I'll be reporting on. And, um, and, and so this, this project was really um, supported and initiated by the, the Mitchell Foundation uh, on a project called Respect Big Bend. And you can go to the website, uh, respectbigben.org, and you can take a look and see what it is what we're, we're trying to do. But the mission is really to, to provide information and empower stakeholders to conserve the resources that they have, the natural resources in the Big Bend area, um, while um, allowing, or not allowing, but while uh, balancing the energy development and the landowner rights that are really um, at, the, at the heart of, of Texas. And so, and so this is the balance. We wanna give folks information so that they can make better decisions. We wanna give them uh, the most, um, you know, kind of up-to-date and unbiased to the extent that we are, you know, we're all human, so we have biases, but we're trying to give them the really, the best data that we can. And then they can make decisions themselves on the lands um, that they own and control. And so this was funded by the Mitchell Foundation. This is our team. This is a, an absolutely fabulous team of, of researchers and colleagues that we've been working with for the last several years. Uh, Borderlands Research Institute at Salt Ross, Nature Conservancy, EDF, um, Kip Averett and Associates, Hudson Pacific and the Texas Ag Land Trust. And they all are, are working together in a really great project to help um, provide the information to local stakeholders in the Southern three counties of far west Texas. So this is um, Presidio, Jeff Davis and Brewster counties. And so um, this project and, and our work at the Bureau and what I'm reporting on here kind of form the foundation for what we can expect in the future, um, the future being up to 2050. And so, um, you know, we are seeking to answer all of these, these sort of uh, questions, where, what, when, who, why, and how.
You know, where is the development likely to take place? What kind of energy is it going to be? Um, who do we want to communicate to? Who needs to have this information as they're making decisions with energy companies of, of all different kinds? And so this is, to us, this was a really important part is that we want to reach the right um, stakeholders and provide them with information that they can then use to make decisions. And um, we had a, a stakeholder advisory group that was um, that was convened that included some elected officials and landowners and, and uh, environmental groups. And it was a broad swath of folks in West Texas. So, um, and they were, they had been guiding us and, and um, uh, helping us to think through this in a way that is going to be effective for West Texas. And so these are the three kind of pillars. We have knowledge development, technical support, and stakeholder outreach. And the Bureau and the Nature Conservancy and Sol Ross really were on the left side of this. We were on the build the knowledge base, right? What are the land attributes? What, are the, uh, what does the land look like? What are the things that people value in the land? Dark skies, open spaces, uh, habitats, migration pathways, and so on. And then the Nature Conservancy developed a program called Conservation by Design or Development by Design that helps to create, um, um, I would say environments where people can talk through uh, what the choices are and, and to come up with the best, uh, the best outcomes for their individual communities. So um, here are the kind of, here's the goal, determine the likelihood that I mentioned before. And this is our workflow. I won't read all of it, but it, basically we, we, want to, um, we want to understand what's occurred in the past. We want to understand what could happen in the future by looking at resource potential. And, and this is reservoir quality, wind class, and, and, so, and basically solar insulation, or how, much, how sunny is it. We then look at scenarios of what the future production might be in terms of the BOE, the barrel of oil equivalent, and the megawatts of electricity that, um, that we expect to be generated um, going forward. We then look at, at criteria and estimate the probability that, that a, a facility or a well pad or a, a, you know, a, a solar field, whichever, might be installed at a particular location in this area, which I, which I will show you. Um, and then, um, then we, we were running some Monte Carlo simulations to look at probabilities of, of likelihood. And then we intersect that new infrastructure with stakeholder values and land attributes that then help to guide uh, the decision making. And so I'm going to start off first with oil and gas. This is uh, an image of West Texas, of course. This is the entire or a large portion of the Permian Basin. We sort of clipped it um, a little bit to the north. Um, this dark area here is the tri-county area. This is These are the three counties that we're really focusing on. Um, and the red outline here are, these are the sub-basins that are, um, that are, are essentially um, made available by IHS market uh, as they map out the Delaware Basin, the Midland, Central Basin, Uplift, and Platform, and so on. And uh, then we went through using remote sensing and uh, data from the Railroad Commission and IHS, and we identified where the well pads were located and how many wells were um, uh, you know, how many, how many wells were on each pad, what was the direct alteration in terms of square kilometers of all of the pads uh, and all of those um, that have been constructed so far going back to 2017. Each one of these green dots is a well. And one of the things to note is that, you know, really the Delaware Basin and, and even this, this um, kind of peninsula here, this may or may not actually be part of the Delaware Basin. We see different interpretations of this quite a bit. But the thing to note is if you sort of lop that off there, uh, then you're really, uh, really along the county line there, there's really not that much uh, of the Delaware Basin that goes into the tri-county area. Um, okay, so, and so looking, you know, of what's been done so far, we calculated the amount of pad construction that dates back to the early 1900s. So this is everything up to 2017. Um, this work was all published last year in a journal of environmental management uh, that John Paul Pierre was lead author on, and it shows um, two maps, one being the alteration as a percent of square kilometers. So this is basically land percent that's been altered, um, a direct alteration from uh, pads, pipelines, and so on. And so you can see uh, areas down in the Southern Tri-County uh, have a little bit of disturbance. These are from pads that uh, where uh, where um, exploration was occurring, there hasn't been a lot of, of uh, significant ongoing oil and gas 
uh, operations there. And then when we add the indirect alteration, we can see that the percentages go up quite a bit from 75% uh, percent up to 93. These are these really dark colors. And um, the indirect alteration has to do with a buffer that we place around the direct alteration. Uh, it's, a, it's a 90 meter um, um, buffer that we place around there. And that is the sort of the common way of looking at indirects from the standpoint of ecosystems, uh, critters and habitats and things like that. So we wanted to include that as part of this. Um, and uh, so our next step, now that we know what's happened in the past is we wanna now, okay, now let's look to see what might happen in the future. And uh, so one of the steps is to identify areas where we, we know that oil and gas uh, and development will not occur in the future. And this would be uh, for uh, wind and solar as well. And so existing infrastructure, cities, uh, rights of way, railroads, urban areas, uh, protected areas like parks, these are all areas that we've excluded um, from, from development. And you can see that there's, uh, there's, there's, there's a bunch of areas. It's, it's kind of diffuse as you go into the center part of the, uh, the study area, but certainly around Big Bend, um, National Park and State Park, these are areas where we're not really expecting to have, uh, and we've excluded from oil and gas. And so we then went through and said, all right, how much oil and gas has been occurring uh, has been produced over the last 10 years? How many well pads have been constructed over the last 10 years? And we, we chose that as a trend going forward because of the you know, unconventional oil and gas development has really occurred 10 to 15 years ago. So if an area in our study area has not experienced any increase in oil and gas activities, our chances are that there would be, uh, there'd be less likelihood that it's going to be producing again in the future. In other words, if the shale rock is not frackable, if it's not likely to be a, pro a producer, then chances are it won't be, um, we, it won't be in the future. So the, so the dark red, um, I guess it's maroon, but it's, it's not quite burnt orange, very dark burnt orange is where the trends are positive and the gray is where the trends are negative. And we also looked at the number of, of pads that were, we were trying to calculate the number of pads going forward because it's not the wells that we're interested in, it's the pads that support the wells. So the more pads there are, the, we, we assume the more likely there's going to be drilling. And so we just use the chain rule here, uh, very simple uh, calculation to estimate what is going to be the change in the pads with time. And then we extrapolate that going forward um, to uh, estimate what the activity will be on the ground. A lot of assumptions behind this in terms of the number of wells per pad, in terms of the price of oil and gas, it's having an influence on this. And there's uh, quite a lot of activity at the Bureau uh, with one of our consortia that's looking at exactly these questions, but um, the data were not available. So this is the approach that we used. And so going forward, we have um, three different scenarios. We have a business as usual, which we're calling our medium scenario. And that's what we see here. And then we have um, a low alteration and a, and a high alteration. So the low alteration means that either there is no drilling operation or there are more wells per pad so that there are fewer pads being constructed. In other words, that's sort of a conservation measure to have multi-well pads, pad drilling, cube drilling, things like that. One of the things that you can see is, uh, um, you know, we're of, of what things might look like in the future under a, a medium scenario. And then if we go and we look at the low impact scenario, and then we look at the high impact scenario, it kind of gives you all toggle back and forth between them, just gives you a sense of what the likelihood is for additional activity, uh, particularly in the middle of the Odessa area, uh, in parts of the Delaware Basin, uh, fairly significant amounts of, of expected future alteration when viewed as a percent of land area. Um, but uh, not a whole lot down in the Tri-County, uh, which uh, turned out to be a little bit of a surprise. And, um, but that's, that's kind of what the, the research is all about is if we're surprised then that's a good thing we, we reacted to it. Um, okay, so that's kind of what the oil and gas is. And we can, we can then eventually, and I'll, as I'll show later, we will overlay this on top of the land attributes. Land attributes that I've described before, grasslands, so migration pathways, habitats, and so on. And then from there, we can see where the intersections uh, may be occurring. But now let's go into um, renewables. A lot of discussion about it these days because of the big chill 
Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and what, is the, what are the implications of this? So, you know, anybody can go and look at this. It's fascinating information. You can go to the ERCOT webpage and you can download what ERCOT expects in terms of um, development going forward. And so um, we have, um, here's the webpage. Uh, it's updated uh, pretty much monthly. And, um, and so this, this chart goes to 2023. This is the short term uh, assessment of that, that, that ERCOT is using for uh, adding additional power lines if needed to reduce congestion on their lines. And so of, of these, um, the this, this stack bar graph, we see here's what's been installed. This is what is, um, has been installed, but is, is now getting synchronized. So it's being plugged into the grid. The IA signed is where they where the energy companies have, um, they already have financing in place. They have the interconnection agreement uh, in place and they are, but they just haven't constructed. You can see that in gigawatts, it's a big number uh, for solar going forward by the end of next year, right? And an additional 11 gigawatts. And then there's, um, then th these are uh, uh, projects that have not yet been um, um, financed. And so we do the same thing for, for um, for wind, uh, wind has ha has uh, has obviously has had quite a bit of a head start. Uh, we can see the big ramp up in wind uh, uh, going forward, and I'm going to have to move my little my little window here a bit. Um, but uh, going forward, you can see, but at least in 2023, um, there's going to still be some connections um, that are are already expected. Uh, and then and then finally, um, just because it's of interest. We wanted to look at battery storage because um, you know there's this whole question. I, mean, I know a lot of discussions at the Energy Institute and across campus and everywhere about storage because you know you can't store electrons the same way that you can store water, for example. So okay, how many batteries are we expecting to get? And so this just shows what the expected same you know the same kind of of um, units, what has been installed, what where the financing on this. And um, so you can see that the what the bar chart is, but of course, you know, um, it looks like it's a lot, but when you scale everything to 40 megawatts using the same scale as the wind and solar, it's, it's, it's not a lot. So we're really only talking about a couple of gigawatts of storage. Texas right now, probably nice sunny day, nice temperature. We're probably, Carrie, what do you think? 40 gigawatts probably of load right now across the state, uh, maybe 35, somewhere in, in that area. So you can see that that number uh, would need to go up in order to make a really big impact. So, okay, so we have uh, what ERCOT is expecting. And then um, we, we worked with uh, Josh Rhodes and Tom Deachin and um, who are well known. Um, Josh would probably had to have a, uh, I don't know how many times he was interviewed during the big chill, many, many times. Heard him, saw him, it was great. Uh, and he and Th Thomas, um, did some mod capacity modeling using the switch to grid planning model to come up with an estimate of what do we expect wind and solar to look like by 2050? What is the number in gigawatts uh, that, that may be in terms of nameplate capacity? So we're not looking at generation yet, we're just looking at capacity of what might be expected. And um, they subdivided the state um, into 15 regions. And, um, and, and you can see them all kind of listed here. We are focusing on region two, which is the Midland region. And where it gets a little bit tricky is that um, our main interest was here. Uh, all the data that we collected was kind of over here and Josh and Thomas, they modeled this whole area. So we have all these different scales, all these different regions of interest, it's very tricky. Um, to do this, but they they considered a lot of things in in their in their study. How many new facilities? Transmission capacity. What's the fuel price? What's the load projections? Where is the load going to be? Um, they didn't quite get into the dispatch that, modeling that I mentioned, but they came up with some estimates that were as good as we could do with the timing and the and the funding that we had. And then the output includes this new wind and solar generation through 2050, uh, and we our focus was really on. Uh, on region two. And so um, here's the BAU case for new solar and wind. Uh, you can see um, in this general region, approximately what these numbers are for the BAU case. Uh, and then, uh, and I will, I'll put those numbers up here in a sec of what the high development scenario for wind and solar might look like going forward. Um, and uh, this, again, in order for, uh, for, um, 
uh, Joshua and, and Thomas to do this, they needed to model the entire state of Texas for you because these are interconnected systems. So you really can't model, um, you know, just one portion of the state because then, uh, then, then it, because it's interacting with all these other things. So our boundaries were the ERCOT region, which makes a study like this tractable. And um, and so just looking at the medium impact scenario, this is a prox. These are approximate numbers here. Uh, new solar. Uh, about 10 and a half gigawatts, new wind, about six and a half gigawatts of nameplate. Um, and so we've got these little bubbles where we kind of add them where we expect these to occur. Um, for sure, if you're looking at wind, wind is most likely going to be deployed in uh, more windy areas, obviously toward the center of the state and up in the panhandle. But the further west you go, the more sunny it gets. So the model basically pushes the solar installations further to the west into Culberson County. Um, and um, their, their uh, finest resolution of discretization was region two. And so we are still working out the mechanics of placing this 10 and a half um, gigawatts or so of, of solar energy into individual counties uh, where they could begin producing electrons. And so, um, okay, so that's how much is gonna be produced. Now, what are areas that are suitable uh, for wind, and I wanted to show this to you. So um, these two graphs uh, show the suitability across the entire study area plus. So this is not only um, this, this right here is our study area, but this gives you a sense of what might be expected all the way out in West Texas. These lines, these are power lines that I'm kind of pointing to. Um, and, uh, and then we have a few solar installations and a bunch of wind. Uh, and uh, the, on the left side is solar. So the redder, the colors, the higher the solar radiance, these are in units of watt per meter square. And on the right side is the wind, and this is basically wind power density. Um, so the higher the value, the windier it is. And that's why you're seeing a lot more of a wind installation that's occurring over there. And so we, uh, so I'll just sort of strip away the, uh, the, uh, the other area outside of our study area and really just kind of focus on this to give you a sense. Now, um, we also have, um, these areas have been blanked out. So you can remember we excluded certain areas, right? And so the reason why you have, it looks almost patchy is because we are excluding areas from development. So there's no reason for us to, uh, to be kind of mapping that out. And you can see that particularly in the wind down here in the big band uh, and, and up, up in these areas here. Okay. For whatever the reason was that it was excluded. Um, okay. So then we say, now we know uh, what the amount is going to be. And we have a sense of what areas are favorable but the thing to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, that, that this is a really large area. And, um, and so, and we're talking only about uh, 13 gigawatts of, of, of solar. So that's a relatively small amount across a very large area. Where specifically might a particular solar installation be placed? And uh, so what we, what we did, and, and um, we, we essentially, identified, and we spoke with a number of, of um, solar companies, uh, utility scale solar companies. We looked at trade, talked to trade organizations. We met with a number of people and we asked them the question, well, when, when, you, when you guys are sitting in the room and you have a map and you're, you're, you're ready, you got, your, you got your, your dart, where do you put the, the facility? Like, what are the things that you're looking at um, that, that are outside of the financing and, and landowner agreements? What are the physical characteristics of the area that you're looking at when you're choosing where to put your specific installation. So over here on the, in the green box listed P1 through P5 are what the parameters are that we have looked at and we have talked with folks about of what they consider to be important. Uh, what is the resource potential? Obviously it needs to be windy and sunny, right? What is the distance to transmission lines? In other words, if you build a utility scale solar facility and you don't have a transmission line, then you don't have income. And you have to have the transmission line in order to make this, this work. What is the distance to roads? Because the further the distance is, the more expensive it's gonna, it's gonna take to, to build and then so on. We don't wanna, you know, putting a, a, a one solar facility immediately next to another solar facility could cause line congestion. So there's usually some sort of a spacing or distance. 
And, and so being immediately adjacent to one we were told was not really ideal. So that we take all of these factors, we then create a general equation. So we have the parameter and then we have a weight and the weight goes from basically zero to one. Uh, we sum all of these up, we take the average, the sums all, and the sums all add up to one. So our, that's our, kind of our general equation. And the higher, um, um, the higher the weight on a particular factor, the more obviously it's gonna be influencing this relative position of where we would be putting the facility. So without getting too far into the weeds, we use a Monte Carlo simulation, we run 2,500 simulations, and then we identify specific pixels that the algorithm is choosing on where it's more likely that a facility will be, um, will be chosen on a particular pixel. And for, for those that do numerics a lot, we actually found that anything over a thousand uh, realizations, um, essentially uh, we, we, were at, uh, we were at steady state. So we just increased it by two and a half times to come up with 2,500. And, um, and our weights that we're using um, vary from, uh, so, so the resource potential varies from zero to one, uh, inverse distance to transmission zero to one, and the others are a, a smaller range. And so just to give you kind of an idea of what this might look like, uh, and again, this is our, this is our, our, our full area of, the, of, of what um, uh, Josh modeled with all of that energy. We, we have weight a W1, which is the solar potential, that we weighted at 60% and the other factors were weighted at 10% each. And I'll show you in a second what the difference makes because it was really quite surprising. So here it's not as sunny, out in the West it's way more sunny. And um, this is now being rescaled as I mentioned before, right? These are all of the parameters that are now weighted and summed to one. So we're going, we're, that's what you're seeing here. And then after 2,500 realizations, this is essentially what we're looking at um, with individual one kilometer uh, pixels that are being chosen for a facility. Uh, we did put a minimum dis a minimum size uh, so that uh, that, that a, um, a facility could be at least 100 megawatts in size. So we didn't have anything that was smaller than that. Now, the thing to note is that the, the maximum number of times that a particular cell was chosen was about 1.8%. So it's such a large area that the amount of land that would be needed for solar is less than half of a percent of all the land in the study area, which becomes important. Now, if we redo this again, where the only weight that we put on is location of transmission lines, and we put that on there because we were told by one of the companies that the only thing that really matters is distance to transmission lines. If you are far away from a transmission line, it is more difficult for ERCOT to manage your electrons when you're producing it when they need it there's a greater likelihood that another um, facility will be installed between you and the power line. So now you're, there's even worse of a congestion issue. Uh, and, and so there's, so that we were told, Hey, that that's really the main thing. So when we use only the distance to transmission lines, high weight on transmission, we can see that we're essentially overlying the majority of the cells are overlying right next to the transmission lines themselves. And the max occurrence that we had from all of our, um, you, know, you know, one of those cells got picked 96% of the time. It really shows you the, the importance of that weight. And these are, these are really difficult um, numbers to come up with because these are being decisions that are being made by people. We're not doing agent-based modeling. Um, we're running now as setting up a, a rubric of, of where we're going to vary all the weights. I think we're going to have uh, somewhere on the order about 30 or 40 separate um, models, each one 2,500 simulations so that we can, we can say, okay, well, depending on what your relative importance is, what are, what are its, you know, what's a more likely area to be chosen? Okay, so um, what are the results for solar? So, um, on the left side, this is the energy profile. So this is low impact, medium and high. Impact meaning this is how much is actually going to be installed. Um, these little dots at the risk of showing this, this is one realization. And you can see how it's kind of scattered, right? Because we're trying to keep the facilities from overlying on top of one another. And then this, um, and I got to move this little deal here. Um, so this is just what the development is going to look like in terms of the percent of per hectare with just one iteration. And when we run 2,500 of them and we take the average, it gives us a much better picture of the possibility or the probability that the area is gonna be picked for, for, uh, for an installation. And on the left, 
Uh, this just is kind of the input. So we're looking at 100 watts is the is the median capacity um, that we're using. We have a 2.6 square kilometers that supports that 100 megawatts. And then these are the land area that uh, we're sort of projecting that would be um, needed to support uh, the area. This is and this is direct impact, not indirect. And I put it in acres too, depending on on whether you want English or, or metric. We do the same thing for for wind. And, um, and so there's 150 megawatt uh, wind facility, takes 47 square kilometers. So this is, uh, remember that, uh, that, that depending on how you view the area around the turbine, it could be 10 times larger per megawatt, um, up to 70. Um, I think if we look at it in acres, it'd be about 70 acres per megawatt versus seven for solar. Okay, so it's a big difference, depending again on how you circumscribe your, your wind tower. And if you have multiple towers, how do you sort of create the buffer area around uh, these, this multiple string of, of, um, of, of, wind, of wind turbines? And there's a lot of different ways to do it. We chose uh, concave hull method, other people are using um, uh, uh, Voronoi uh, triangles lots of different ways to do it. We picked one that we thought was, was more flexible. And so uh, this is the number of facilities given, again, Thomas and Joshua's model. Uh, this is the area that would be uh, needed to support that, 11,000 square kilometers for the high uh, at 10.8 uh, at to megawatts. Uh, and then you saw this uh, about 6,400 or so uh, for the medium. Okay, so rolling all of that up, we have these numbers. Uh, what the current direct land use is right now, what the approximate range of the future might look like in terms of square kilometers. Uh, and so you've seen many of these numbers before, but uh, we just uh, added them up. Um, and, you know, this is what the range might look like depending on the mix, depending on lots of things that are difficult to, for us to control. Um, but th these are the numbers that we came up with anywhere between about 3,500 to 17 and a half thousand square kilometers of land would be used. Uh, in that entire region that you've been, you've been looking at. Okay, now the question is, okay, now we know how much land might be needed now, and we know where it might be needed. Can we estimate what the effects on the land attributes are gonna be? Because the, you know, out in West Texas, le you know, um, hunting leases is very important. Uh, open skies are very important. Um, migration pathways for, for, for birds and, you know, and, and pronghorn and, and mule deer and, and, bear, and bear and all of these are very, very important attributes that we are trying to understand where they are and what might be the impact to those attributes if energy development occurs in them. So we have a workflow that the Nature Conservancy put together. We do the same kind of thing we did before. We have 10 attributes here that are listed, right? right? They're all with view sheds, nighttime lights, uh, dark skies, you know, things like that. They are all scaled from zero to one. Some of these are qualitative, so it gets a little bit tricky. They are all summed. We then plot those out onto, uh, 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 into a GIS um, uh, platform. We then use a focal window, which is essentially a 2D moving average to come up with kind of an estimate of what a, and, and the focal window is uh, basically a three, a three by three cell focal window that is then moving back and forth across uh, the region so that we can get a, a sense of, of, of how the different land attributes, when all summed equally together with no weights, how they kind of vary across the, the area. And I, I will show that in a second. Then we plot all those up and we overlay the land attributes map onto the energy development so that we can see where those intersections are the highest. So here are the, here's what the, the, the map is. And, and um, uh, this is, Super uh, helpful to Kay Sochi at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, thank you, Kay. I hope you're listening. Uh, and this is her map, but it shows uh, that, um, you know, this, these in red, 24.8% means that that particular pixel has at least three attributes. Not all pixels have all attributes, right? And so this is kind of a Gaussian shape distribution and very few, for example, have an, um, have all nine attributes. Um, you can go down here to the Big Bend, it has a lot of them. It has water, open skies, um, you know, pronghorn, grasslands, all of those things. And so then we go ahead and we then update the values mapping. 
and we say these are the areas that are most valuable in green and the areas where the land attributes are less valuable, they're in purple. And so um, that way we can, we can estimate where, um, you know, what percentage of the land is gonna be impacted. And you can see again, I've just placed the values mapping, uh, all those uh, 10 factors on the left. And so um, I'm gonna move my little thing here again. So um, this is for solar. And these are the uh, asset maps for solar that are now intersecting uh, how many acres are intersecting with, with different quality of lands. So very high is in green and very low is in purple. And you know, for these three counties that I'm kind of highlighting, Brewster, Jeff, Davis, and Presidio, what is the amount of land in those counties that might intersect with energy development? Um, and you can see where, uh, where that is occurring. So um, for example, there's very um, small amounts of land that are of low quality where it would intersect with, um, with energy development, but there are other areas where it's very high. So in Presidio County, for example, down in here, um, it looks like 60%, 70% of the very high quality land is what's intersecting with potential solar. So a land owner, um, a mineral rights holder, an energy company might be able to use this and say, okay, maybe there are some other areas within Presidio County that we could use that might intersect with very low or lower asset class uh, so that we can preserve the, you know, the, um, uh, the higher, more valuable, I put in quotes, more valuable land. Uh, we do the same thing for, uh, let me see if I got this. We use, oh, did I miss it? Okay, so now we do the same thing for wind. And, um, and so now you can see where the, where the winds are with these, uh, all of these different classes as well. And so, um, and I kind of highlighted this, the counties where they, they tend to be the highest. Um, you know, the, our, our real area was, was kind of down in here, uh, down in the Tri-County, but we had, um, you know, once you start with GIS, you just can't stop. Uh, it's like an addiction. And uh, so we just kept going and we, we analyzed the whole area. Um, and, um, but what it does show is, is in acres, 377,000 acres of land is where there's an intersection of a likelihood of wind development with a very high uh, land asset class. So again, this might help mineral rights holders, landowners, energy companies, and so on, um, help them to kind of make these decisions. So um, that's kind of what I have. Um, and uh, I, I do have some take home messages, the things that we, that kind of surprised us. I said, what surprised you? Well, I mean, we, we did, our study did show, you know, different scenarios for future installations of energy related infrastructure. That's really the main thing. Um, when we start adding in a mix of wind, solar, oil, and gas into this area, there's gonna be an additional cost to, um, to land resources, right? So the question is, how do we reduce that? What are the things that we could do to, uh, to balance these trade-offs. So that if we wanna transition the grid, we wanna have a future energy mix, that's a mix of baseload and intermittent, how do we decide, how do we think about um, how much of each type of energy we are going to install and where exactly they should be? Where could they be, which uh, basically has the least cost to land resources? Um, the placement of transmission lines is very important. Um, we had some energy companies saying that was the most important thing. We had other energy companies saying it was the least important thing. So we varied the importance because everybody has a different business model that they're looking at. Um, and so if you can think about the transmission lines as being essentially a signal for where future renewable uh, you know, wind and solar may be located, then actually choosing the transmission line becomes a, a very important factor to think about. Uh, and so, um, you know, we've, we've got uh, West Texas is spectacular area. It's very difficult to restore deserts, especially in, the more arid it is, the more difficult it is to do. So thinking about restoration early reduces the land impacts early on. And I've seen pictures of revegetation right underneath solar panels with no irrigation in West Texas, and they have nearly full cover crop. Uh, so there are ways to do it. You have to have the right seed mix, you have to have the right soil conditions, and then you can essentially restore your areas, which is, which is great, just great. And so um, understanding these trade-offs help in the decision-making, right? I mean, I had to put something that's so obvious at the end. Data and information help in the decision-making. 
we hope that that is the kind of things that we um, that, that people take into account and that uh, maybe some of the work that we did was helpful. Um, I'm going to stop there. I think we're trying to make it right at 45 minutes, Carrie, and looking at 13, 15 hours right on time. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who's here and, uh, and really to thank the Mitchell Foundation. They have been spectacular to work with and really fun. And, my, and the whole team has been great. The Texas Star Program has been uh, very, very helpful. Jack School of Geosciences at UT. Um, and with that, I will stop and I will entertain any questions. Thank right. you. Thank you, Michael. Um, first of all, what are those uh, endangered species next to the pen there uh, that were? <laughs> yes, I mean, it's amazing what you will find out in West Texas. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'll get some of the questions online here. There, one, uh, you discussed the, uh, I guess, attributes of, uh, uh, I guess, wind and solar, and I guess oil and gas areas in these six parameters and their weightings. And you said, I think you running many combinations of weightings and then seeing how it influences where develop development would occur. So there's a question asking about these weightings, but I think maybe you could phrase it as if, how, how would you interact with someone? Would you that use these weightings to interact with someone who's interested in the land impacts? Would you say, what do you think is important to you? And then show them the results that are most weighted according to what they think or something else or some combination? How, how do you yeah, know? that's a great question. And, um, and this is where you get into the, it's a little bit sticky. Now think about it, thinking about oil and gas, um, you know, the oil and gas exploration is going to occur where the rocks are good. The wind and solar can more or less go anywhere around there. It has to have certain land attributes. In other words, the slope of the land can't be more than, let's say, 5%. It needs to, you want it facing south. I mean, there are certain characteristics that make it more favorable for solar. Same with wind, right? If it's, up, if it's too steep of a slope, it's very expensive. It probably doesn't work as well, those kinds of things. So, um, and, and our stakeholder group, they also went through and said, um, these are the most important things for us. Right, so every community, whether you go Pecos, Midland, Odessa, is going to have a very different, potentially very different um, um, set of, of weights um, in, in say, uh, you know, Marfa and Alpine and, uh, and the Balmeray area, Fort Davis. So it, it is somewhat geographically dependent on what those weights are. And I think that to me, that is a, that's kind of a, a consideration here. Now, um, what we're trying to do is we're, we're now setting up the deck so that we can run all of the different um, estimates of what these weights are so that if a person says, my interest is less on the tr transmission line and more on the wind aspect or more on the proximity to roads, we would be able to then show how those different weights are influencing the relative uh, probability that a particular area is going to be kind of picked were uh, picked for uh, any kind of energy development. So it's certainly something we could use for, for, um, for discussion and then people can use it in, in different ways. All right, thanks. So you obviously touched on transmission. There's a couple questions here along those lines. Uh, obviously we have the competitive renewable energy zone process planning to go to windy areas. Um, is the, is the project anticipating something for going out more west for solar, say, or maybe just more wind and saying, yeah, build the, if you're going to make a new renewable zone type of uh, plan, do it here and not there? Well, I, I, one of the things um, um, that's very interesting to look at, I'm, I'm sure that you look at it, I, I wait eagerly every year to see the short term, uh, the short term reports that ERCOT is expecting to be building for power lines. So um, certainly if there's going to be a new power line that's installed, uh, that would signal to us that there's probably gonna be some uh, power generation that's going to be occurring in, in the future. Um, we, we, we did, because we didn't do the dispatch modeling, we didn't basically drill down to the area where we said, okay, this is more likely to be solar, this is more likely to be wind. But the model did show that the further west you go, in the study area, the more likely it is that you're going to have solar because the solar radiance is that much higher. And because the, when, the low, when the sun is setting in the load centers, the sun is still bright in West Texas. 
So the sun sets half an hour, 45 minutes sooner in the load center area along I-35 corridor in Houston than it does in West Texas. So the model basically pushes more of that electricity further west you go. Now, having said that, you know, we, you know, there are solar facilities all over the state of Texas. So it may not always be the solar radiance that is the key. There are a lot of factors besides just how sunny it is that might influence where the facility is located. Could be proximity to load centers. The closer it is, the easier it is for, uh, for ERCOT to manage, um, to manage the, uh, the electrons that are being produced. And therefore, the more valuable the electrons become. So there's a whole bunch of things that we were not able to account for in our study um, that, uh, that, that, that could make a difference. We were really only able to handle part of them with what we could do. Thanks. So there's a question on uh, Okay, Carrie, I lost you on the question. Oh, sorry, I'll ask again. Okay. Uh, how do we think about how does the study think about the view shed? I guess you know the aesthetics of the view shed of the landscape in relation yep. to wind, oil and gas and solar development. Let me just dovetail so you have the direct land and the indirect land. Uh, maybe that comes in into there as well, but how do people, do you find people on the ground or have you explored this, sort of have a concept for thinking about the difference between direct and indirect and is that really about animals and, or is it more, more about animals than people or, or both? Um, the view shed was very important uh, and that was one of the primary um, uh, attributes that the stakeholder group and others that we have spoken to that they find of, of great importance is the view shed. We've heard this many times from folks out there. So the view shed could be looked at um, from just from the beauty of the landscape on the one hand, and it can be that it has an impact to, um, to birds, bats, and other flying creatures. I guess that birds and bats covers most of them. Um, but, um, you know, so, so, so wind is, is, is a little bit tough to, to, to nail down in terms of the direct versus indirect because you know, there's all the space in between the turbines, much of which can still be multi-purposed by, um, by landowners. They can continue to graze. There is, there's still hunting um, that, can, be, that can, can occur. So there's a lot of things that the land can continue to be uh, kept in production uh, for the landowner. But so the impacts are really either both view shed and impacts to birds and other, you know, flying, flying creatures. But that did turn out, um, you know, to be of great importance to the stakeholders. And that's something that we definitely incorporated. Now, we didn't add additional weight on it um, because it was it just became a very, very difficult um, to have 100 percent of you shed. But we did map all that out and, and look at that carefully. So someone can look at the 100 percent view shed weighting versus zero percent everything else and see the difference. <laughs> they could, in theory. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's uh, I guess someone trying to make a takeaway from your, uh, as you said, uh, GIS, where you just can't stop uh, <laughs> excited about doing it for people like yourself. Um, it's, a, it's a question here. I don't maybe a takeaway from looking at the graphs. Is, is there a takeaway that, that the best place to put wind out there is where oil and gas is already existing? And is this um, easy to done? I don't yeah, and I, I just want to clarify that I'm an idiot when it comes to GIS, um, but <laughs> I can see where it's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible at it. Just ask John Paul. Um, uh, so there's 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 absolutely multiple sources of energy production occurring on the land. So um, yeah, when you're looking at uh, putting um, you know wind in an area where there's oil and gas, uh, I think that especially in areas where the land is already of marginal quality, uh, then that's a, that I would say that that's a good thing. Uh, but that's a decision, you know, I'm, not, I'm trying, not trying to put a value judgment on it, but there's absolutely an ability to have wind, solar, oil, and gas kind of coexisting. Um, and uh, we've seen pictures all around the, from, you know, Fort Stockton all the way east. This is, this is not, uh, it's not uncommon to see that. So this is for sure um, kind of uh, co-purposing that land, multi-purposing that land is a good thing. Right. Uh, there's a question about just, I guess accessibility or communicating this information. One is, you know, is there some tool that will be made public or a series of graphs or charts? That's kind of one thing. How, how can the public interact with this? Second, you know, is there any plan for interacting with the legislature and 
either in the context of the big chill, as you say, or, or not. Yeah, so the so we have a um, so within you know just being at a at a dot edu we often rely on peer review publications so that's one venue um, we have uh, an entire um, process of rolling out the reports the reports should be made public within weeks um, I'm not sure exactly the date of the rollout but there's certainly going to be uh, we hope a, a kind of a big splash. Uh, we are, um, you know, uh, Kip Averett, who is a former senator in the ledge. Uh, he is he is helping to um, not to craft policy, but but to help put what we're doing into the context of the kinds of things that policymakers are thinking about. Um, you know, when we started the study, you know, we didn't really expect to have um, the sort of um, you know occurrence in February that we all had, and so this has taken, I, I would say, a little bit more. Uh, of an importance, knowing um, you know of what are the you know what are the possible implications of having of having a mix, you know where where the mix is located, how it's being managed. I mean, all of these are now questions that are uh, that are at the forefront of of the ledge of of the public. I'd say ERCOT is now known nationally. Probably a lot of people didn't know what ERCOT was, but I bet they do now. And so we are certainly talking about this. But our job, my job, you know, at the university is not to is not to do policy. It's, it's, I, you know, I'm not, I don't pretend to know what those implications are, but we do think that there's probably some policy um, discussions that need to happen based on this. Okay. Any, any thought of just like an online interface? I know the pain of doing this. Yeah, no, no great, great having question. Having available in a lookup table might be easier for, for yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we want to, we, we want to have um, uh, online resources like this. I, I, I don't know specifically, um, uh, Carrie, if you know who the, 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 uh, the person asking the question, give me their contact. And, and when this thing goes public, we will try to, to do that. I, I don't know specifically to what extent this is going to be a fully publicly available mapping app, uh, in part because every year, right, every year the conditions are changing. Right? Think about having um, a mapping app right now. And then five years from now, we have uh, additional say 10 gigawatts of solar wind. There's all this oil and gas activity. The land attributes are changing because the land has been, um, is now being used for, for other purposes. So we need to somehow come up with a way of making the, the analyses evergreen so that as the uh, energy um, transition or as we look to the you know, electricity sources in the future, we can continue to sort of look at this uh, in, in a way and keep it and kind of keep it up to date. We've not quite gotten to that point yet, but um, we have had those discussions and we are all keen on not making this a one-off project. We know that there's going to be a lot of interest in this, um, both in West Texas, as well as the overall approach for, for bringing people together at the table. And I, I really think that that's, that's a very important story and a really great outcome of the study. Right, there's a, I think you addressed a couple of the questions here. One was, yeah, will this be evergreen? I think someone used the term. So uh, it's always always a challenge to do some fancy, nice work and then keep it up to date. Yeah. Uh, need support for that. And uh, yeah, I think you addressed one of these other questions, which is, you know, as land use changes in other places or, or other power plants are installed, you know, can you sort of account for how that changes yep. the mix in this particular area of study? And I guess you can ex expand it out if you would like as well. Um, there's one question, which I think the person knows the answer to, um, the, the maps and the data stopped at the far West end of Culberson County. Is that just the ERCOT boundary and you're just paying attention yeah. to the ERCOT boundary? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that was the reason. Right. Fair enough. And, and I, I, one of the things I want to mention in terms of the, the sort of the start and the stop of the project. You know, we did not account for, you know, there's a lot of aspects to this in terms of the life cycle analysis for these facilities. Like, where did all the materials come from? What happens when they're, when they're demobilized, right? Um, what is it going to look like going, going forward? We didn't really account for a lot of that. We were really just looking at the generation side. But that's a part, it's a very, uh, also a really complex and interesting and important thing to look at is that if, we, we, you know, we're talking about uh, 10 gigawatts of, of solar, for example. Well, where are all the, where's all the material coming from to build the solar panels? How do, we, how do we manage that? What's the ecosystem impacts of the land right where we are actually installing 
the facility. So, um, so, uh, so Catherine um, Jones, who is a master's student in the Jackson School, her work is to look at some of the ecosystem services impacts from specifically where we put, um, you know, a, a particular facility. So that also comes with a cost. And so when you're trying to balance the, the value of the energy resource to the cost of the land, we can then be a little bit more holistic and thorough in thinking through what the balance looks like from a variety of different uh, perspectives. Right, maybe I'll, I'll throw out this last one, which is maybe a, a broader expansion of what you just said is there are, you know, often usually things that are not taken into account yet and can, can potentially be in the future. And so there are, let's just say non-direct, non-land related things that people are um, may find of interest about uh, energy infrastructure, jobs, uh, cost of electricity, obviously, and health from having different kinds of power plants and other areas or near cities of these kinds of things. So has there been any discussion of trying to think about that uh, in the context of this project or maybe outside the context of this project? Well, um, in the context of the project, um, we've, we've, we've kind of stayed away from the health implications of what these decisions are for right now, just, just so that we could make this tractable. Um, we have had discussions about um, the reality that the economy in West Texas is very heavily dependent on oil and gas activities. What are the things that could be done to, uh, to kind of, I would say flatten the curve to, to, for lack of a better uh, phrase, um, it's very sort of covid I suppose, but we wanna try, you know, what are the ways of diversifying the economy out there because that ev eventually gets into the health impacts as well by um, um, and through perhaps restoration, through different types of energy sources, there are, are different ways to kind of diversify the economy. Um, and, uh, you know, at a very, very broad scale, you know, we, we know if we, if we look at, 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 you know, energy and environment and, and economics, right, these are all kind of interlinked. And they're, they're impacting the, um, the well-being of the communities. What are the things that we can do from the science standpoint to kind of inform um, inform the communities, not to make choices for them, but to give them the information that they can use to make their own choices. So uh, um, certainly health, um, for example, we didn't really look at carbon emissions. That obviously has a, a sort of a global impact. Uh, we didn't look at the water piece either. These are things that we're talking about going forward because water is a super important aspect. This whole story is uh, um, produced water, uh, potable water, uh, groundwater surface water interaction with springs and so on. So all of these things are connected uh, in certain ways. And, and um, you know, we, 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 we were only able to take this one bite, um, but we are always thinking about what the next, uh, you know, what are the things that we need to do and what are the gaps that currently exist from our study and from other studies. Well, all right. Awesome, Michael. So I think we'll end it there. I thought it was a great talk, uh, very informative, a lot of great detail there. Uh, so thank you very much, Michael Young, Senior Research Scientist of the Bureau of Economic Geology here at UW.